is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday live stream. We have the one and only Lou on tonight. How the heck are you? It's last time you're on. Good. It was an amazing stream. It's been far too long. Sorry. Welcome back. Thanks for joining <laughs> I'm us. I'm always happy to be on with you, Devin. You know that. Oh, I love it. So. Um, it's definitely been a while. You are the master when it comes to nutrients. You know it better than anyone else out there, um, which is today's main topic. Um, it's something that a lot of people don't fully understand. I know there's always a lot of questions on it, and you are the best fountain of information out there. So I think it's going to be a good one today. Well, you know, the nutrients are some. I'm still learning about the nutrients. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're constantly learning what the corals need, what they mm -hmm. don't need. Um, and there's no silver bullets. You know, people are always calling me and saying, these are my nutrient levels. My tank looks really bad. What should I do? It, it so much depends on the individual system um, that you really need to kind of have a little bit of understanding of what goes on with the nutrients in the tank so that you can understand how to tweak your particular system to optimize it for your animals. And every single system is going to be different. It's the one thing that keeps this hobby so interesting. <laughs> it's, it's very true. I, I guess that's the tricky part when you're getting all these questions, right? It's like you, you have general advice, but again, every tank is a bit different, but. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to get all the pieces of information that you need to figure it out because at the end of the day, the best person to figure out what that tank needs is the hobbyist that owns that tank because they know those corals. They know the minute those corals are looking a little bit unhappy or the minute they're looking a little bit more happy, you know, it's really, you really have to learn to love to watch the tank. And I've said this a million times, you need to learn to speak the language of the tank. You need to understand what the tank is saying to you because you can have the best experts in the world telling you what to do it means may mean nothing for your particular system, you know? So you got to learn to hear what your tank is saying to you. No, that's very true. And now that, that is something that comes with experience. So, I mean, that's, I guess the trickier part if you're new, John, thanks for the super chat. Um, so as your tank ages, you know, things settle more, but you also learn your tank where you know what, what that coral looks like when it's happy or if it has an issue. And that tells you a lot. But someone new, again, they don't necessarily know these things. So there's almost two different aspects of the, the new reefer versus the experienced reefer that can, you know, whisper to the corals a little more. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's all about learning the basics and then applying those basics to your system. Mm -hmm. um, and nutrients are something that are mostly misunderstood um you know uh, i was i was i had a call from a guy today that says you know his his phosphate level is is zero um and he's growing all this algae in his tank and he doesn't understand how the phosphate level could be zero when he's growing all this algae and obviously the phosphate level is zero because the algae is eating and taking yep. all the phosphate <laughs> out of the water you know and and that's a difficult thing it's a difficult concept to get your head around because mm. Where, where is it all? You know, how do I yeah. deal with that? What do I, what do I do in a situation like that? Um, and so you have to kind of figure those things out as you go and understanding mm -hmm. how those corals are using the nutrients and what they're using them for and what they look like when the nutrient level is a little bit high or a little bit low gives you some indication of how to deal with situations like that that yeah. can be really tough. I mean, that can be a really mm -hmm. hard situation. Yeah, exactly. Well, the example you gave, I mean, there probably is very high phosphates which are getting eaten up just the moment they're being leached out by the algae, which is causing yeah, the girl exactly. crazy. No, yeah. exactly. And that's not a situation you're going to resolve overnight. You know, mm -hmm. the, the I always tell people the worst thing you can do, even when you're going from bad to good, is to change it too quickly. Those corals are animals that they they're they're constantly living by osmosis and diffusion. They're mm -hmm. exchanging water and nutrients with their environment all day long every day if you change the environment too quickly mm -hmm. you change what's inside of them too quickly you either yeah. dry them out or you make them in too engorged with water you make them blow up mm -hmm. and they don't take kindly to that so even when you're going from bad to good you have to go slowly and i think 100% agree with you. And I think that's a hard thing, especially for new reefers, because you, you know, you want it fixed now, you don't want to wait. And, you know, most people aren't patient. And eventually, everybody wants a pill. <laughs> it's, everybody, it's everybody wants a pill you can put in a tank and it makes everything look great. Oh, exactly. I mean, who wouldn't do that? But well, listen, I have yeah. some information for you tonight about yeah. nutrients that uh, as part of a presentation yeah. that I do, that 
I try to lay it out a little bit so that people can get a sense of what's happening with these nutrients in your system. Mm-hmm. How is your corals? You how is your are your corals using those those nutrients? What do they do with them, and why are they important? Why mm-hmm. is phosphate important? What what is what is up with ammonia and ammonium yeah. and you know what 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 is important about that so i've got some graphic stuff i can show you that Beautiful. kind of explains this a little yeah. bit easier all right see what you got <laughs> all right so Catch. let me get into it here i'm going to do a screen capture Sounds we'll see good. if we can get see if we can get this working properly all right uh Beautiful. let me see if i can get this going there we go um this is just an interesting graphic. This is actually a graphic from NOAA of uh, ocean currents. Oh, um, that's pretty cool. And uh, the date on the, I think it's in the upper right-hand corner yeah. there, is actually the date that these ocean currents uh, were measured. So <laughs> kind of an interesting uh, kind of an interesting graphic when, when you look at. The reason I'm showing this in a nutrient talk is because what you want to understand is that these are currents that are moving nutrients all over the oceans. Hmm. And these nutrients become key pieces of what makes the oceans healthy or not. And these are the kind of currents that are moving these nutrients all all over. So um, what nutrients are we talking about? Well, we're talking mostly today about phosphates, nitrates, and ammonium. And why do we talk about things like nitrate and ammonium? Well, there's two interesting numbers on this chart here. Look at the amount of nitrogen that's in nitrate and the amount of nitrogen compound that's in ammonium. The point here is that your corals don't really care about nitrate. And the reason they don't care about it too much is because they're not getting their nitrogen compounds from nitrate. It's too inefficient. There's very little nitrogen compounds in nitrate. They would much rather get their ammonium, their their nit- their nitrogen compounds from ammonium um, or uric acid. Um, those those kinds of compounds, urea, not uric acid, urea. Um, those are the things that they're getting their nitrogen compounds for. Because look, there's like three times as much, and oh, so huge. they don't have to break down as much in order to get what they need. Makes sense. So we're going to go to some basics first. Uh, before we get to specifics of a tank. And I like to talk about ammonia and ammonium for an inst- for a minute because some aquarists don't understand the difference and I have a really cool way to kind of explain why those two compounds are different and, and the difference is important. So here's a little graph where you can see the ammonium on the left and the ammonia on the right. Now keep in mind that ammonia... Uh, ammonium is not very toxic and ammonia is much more toxic and if you look at the numbers here and these bottom little lines you can see that at a ph of 8.1 to 8.2 which is pretty close to what natural seawater is Mm -hmm. the amount of ammonium is very high and the amount of ammonia is very low that's why it's not all that toxic in in seawater But now, if we let that pH drift up to the equilibrium point, which is 9.26, you can see that now there's equal amounts of ammonium and ammonia. And that extra ammonia becomes very toxic. This, by the way, is the biggest difference between, in my opinion, between saltwater and freshwater tanks. Um, This is why in a a saltwater tank, um, things can get very toxic when there are problems. If your um, if your pH goes down very low and there's any ammonia in the tank, which often happens when there's an issue, a big rasp goes under a rock and dies or something, the, the, the alkalinity goes down, the pH goes down, and at that lower pH, most of that ammonia is in the form of ammonium. So it's not a problem. Hmm. Now, you you find that your tank's pH is low. You do everything you can to create the to to correct the pH problem, 
And all of a sudden, your pH is up to 8.4 or 8.5. And what's happened is now you've converted a bunch of your non-toxic ammonium into extremely toxic ammonia. Uh, this happens sometimes people do a 50% water change to fix the pH. They fix the alkalinity in the pH, but they only got rid of half of the ammonia. And now all of that remaining ammonium has turned to ammonia and is toxic and the tank crashes. In a freshwater tank where the pHs run much lower, you don't get that problem because you don't get the high level of ammonia. It's interesting. Biggest difference, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. And... The correlation to with the pH, how much it affects it. A, a tremendous amount. Um, all right. Oh, yeah. There's my little non no less toxic and more toxic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here's a, a, a really quick little explanation of why there's a difference in the toxicity between the two. You can see ammonia on the left is NH3 and ammonium mm -hmm. is NH4. And that extra hydrogen ion gives a positive charge to the ammonium. Now, mm -hmm. here's why that makes a difference. And this is kind of interesting when, when you look at it this way. Um, all the chemists are going to yell at me now because this is not 100% chemically correct. But it is correct in principle. Here's my small ammonia uh, uh, molecule, mm -hmm. NH3. It's very small. And you can see in the background that I've got these holes. This represents the porosity of a cell membrane. It's like little okay. holes. Yeah. And the holes are fairly large. So the ammonia uh, molecule can search around until it finds a hole and it can go through that hole, through the cell, uh, through the cell membrane into the cell to do its damage. That's why it is toxic because it's mm -hmm. small enough to get through those little holes. Now, when we're talking about ammonium with that positive charge on it, Remember now, this is existing in water, H2O. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about water, the water molecule, is that even though it is a neutral molecule, because it's made up like a little Mickey Mouse, the, one, the, the side with the hydrogen is slightly more positive, and the, slide, the side that doesn't have the hydrogen is slightly more negative. This is actually what makes water such a good solvent why things dissolve in water is because there is this unequal charge from one side to the other. Well, since the ammonium molecule has a positive charge on it, the water lines up with its negative charges all around the ammonium molecule or ion. Mm -hmm. And now what happens is you've created essentially a much larger molecule. And when this molecule tries to get through that little holes in the cell membrane it can't get through it's too yeah. big it's kept outside mm. and this is why it's much less toxic the ammonia can get through to do its damage yeah. the ammonium can't so it's there's <laughs> two important things now now we're going to switch gears we're going to talk about zooxanthellae yeah. there's two important things that the zooxanthellae is going to supply to the coral polyp, jelly beans and bricks, which, I, which actually what I mean is energy and building blocks, yeah. but we're going to call them jelly beans and bricks. So here's the way this works. The zooxanthellae within the coral polyp are photosynthetic little buggers, and they're going to use solar energy from the sun or the the light that we have in our tank, and they're going to take carbon dioxide and water, and they're going to undergo photosynthesis, and they're going to produce glucose and oxygen. This is where a good part of the oxygen in the tank comes from. That glucose is the, build, the energy that the corals are going to use. It's essentially like sugar. It's the energy for the corals. That is the jelly beans. Mm -hmm. All right. Glucose, we're calling the jelly beans. Now, we're, in order to talk about the bricks, we're going to talk about nitrification 
and denitrification. Let's talk about nitrification first. This is the aerobic respiration that happens in the tank. Uh, this is done largely by the archaea. Um, we, we've always talked about nitrosomonas and, and um, nitrospira as, as the important factors. But in fact, what we're finding is that it's archaea which are largely responsible for for this aerobic respiration. Now that's a and, strain of bacteria, right? Yeah, uh, it, it's it's well, they're kind of bacteria. <laughs> they're what, what they're not it? exactly okay. bacteria. Microbes. Um, they're 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 actually their own classification, as huh, far as okay. I understand it. I'm not okay. a chemist. I'm not a biologist, so I could be wrong about that. But my understanding is that archaea is kind of a its own category from bacteria but it is it, it is kind of it's always been thought of as bacteria but technically maybe it's not and if i'm wrong okay. about that somebody will make a comment and yell at me um so here is the the uh equation for the first step of aerobic respiration which is in the night this nitrification process that we're talking about and you can forget about the the numbers here for a minute and, and the, the chemical equation. What's important here that is that in nitrification, we're going to take ammonia and oxygen, and we're going to turn it into nitrite and hydrogen ions and water and energy. And then we're going to take that nitrite in the second step, and this is where the nitrospina comes in in a nitrobacter, we're going to take that nitrite in the second step, and we're going to add oxygen to it, mm -hmm. and that's going to produce nitrate and then energy. Now, there's a cool thing that happens here, which is the amount of energy that is produced in the first step plus the amount of energy that's produced in the second step equals 311 kilojoules per mole. And doesn't matter if you understand that what that is. It, it's not important, the technicalities of it. We're going to see how that number 311 comes into play in just a second. Okay. Lots of energy. So nitrification, we're producing energy. It goes from nitrite into nitrate plus energy. That's why when you're looking at a tank cycle, you look at nitrite first and you see that mm -hmm. nitrite spike. And then you look for the nitrate spike where the nitrite disappears because it's being converted into nitrate and energy. Then you know that nitrofin nitrification cycle has worked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step is the anaerobic respiration, which is the off-gassing, which is the denitrification. This is where we're going to get rid of the nitrogen. So what happens is we start with that nitrite, nitrate that we produced in our, in our first step in the, in the aerobic respiration. We're going to add some electrons to it and, and some hydrogen ions, some just straight old hydrogen ions. And we're going to end up producing nitrogen gas, which is going to off-gas, and water. Hmm. And uh, in the next step of the process, which is the assimilatory nitrate reduction, this is where the algae within the coral, the zooxanthellae, really comes into play. We're going to take that 311 kilojoule per mole that was produced in the nitrification process. We're going to add it to some nitrate some hydrogen ions and some electrons, and we're going to produce ammonia and water and hydroxide ions. And this ammonia is where the amino acids are going to come from that we're going to use to build our proteins. These become the building blocks. Those amino groups from the ammonia is where we're going to get our amino acids hmm. to make the building block blocks, which is how the polyps are going to grow. 
So all, all these years, like, in pneumonia is bad, and here it's actually providing us some good stuff. Oh, totally. Yeah. The tank can't exist without <laughs> the ammonia that ends up turning into ammonium that ends up turning into proteins. Mm -hmm. All right. So, by the way, this is that tank that I love so much in the Dormero Roats Hotel in Halle, Germany. It's one of my favorite reef tanks in the entire world. And what I Beautiful. love about it so much is that it displays all, it, it, it just throws out all of the theories that you can't put soft corals with hard corals. You don't need a lot of fish. This guy's got zebra mores in here. Um, it, it, he's got corals that, he's got angels that are coral eaters. Um, He's growing so much Upside coral down. that he started <laughs> hanging acros down from the top. That's crazy. I was going to say, they're upside down. <laughs> yeah, well, he's hanging them from the top because no more room to, to grow them up from the bottom. That's this insane. is literally one of my favorite reef tanks in the entire world. It's about 350 gallons, uh, and it's in the Dormero Roats Hotel in Halle, Germany. That's very uh, cool. Really cool video to see. He put They put out a video every year of what the tank's looking like. Yeah. And also, it's not a new tank. This tank's been running, I don't know, eight to ten years at this point. Oh, that's amazing. It's an amazing tank. I love it. All right. Enough about that one. So nutrient concentrations on a coral reef. Um, these are a lot of charts, and I'm just going to summarize them for you because you can get bleary-eyed looking at some of this data. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are some important takeaways from that kind of data. The first takeaway is that phosphate concentrations on coral reefs are somewhere between 0.01 and 0.02 ppm. That is extremely low. Mm -hmm. We don't want to keep our tanks that low. We're going to talk in a minute about how we get around that. But the point is that if you actually go and measure the phosphate concentration on a coral reef, it is way lower than what we generally keep in our reef tanks. Yeah. The second takeaway is that the combined nitrate and nitrite concentrations are around 0.02, maximum 0.1 if you're looking at nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So that means that this nitrate phosphate ratio, not only does it rarely exceed 10 to 1, it's frequently as low as 1 to 1, or if you're talking about nitrogen phosphate ratios as th instead of nitrate, you're talking about total nitrogen phosphate ratios, maybe as high as three or four to one, but so, never as high as like the Redfield ratio. 10 or 16. Yeah. So that's basically out the window. Yeah. Redfield ratio, as far as I know, was done on surface algae in deep water. Mm -hmm. So this is algae that's floating on the surface in very, very deep ocean water. Has nothing to do with corals and coral reefs. Mm -hmm. And although if you take that algae and you look at it, it's got about a 16 to 1 ratio of nitrate to phosphate in it. That's not what's true on a coral reef. And so we need to throw out the, the Redfield ratio and look at how do we maintain the phosphate how do we supply the phosphates that our corals need when the phosphate in the water column is so extremely low? Mm -hmm. So what does science say about nutrients? Well, corals need phosphates to grow and thrive. There's no question about that. They must have the phosphates that they need. Corals need at least 0.02 ppm phosphate to show a net phosphate uptake mm -hmm. and they really need more than that. That's the absolute bare minimum. Yeah. If the phosphate concentration is below 0.02 ppm, then phosphates are going to leach from the coral out into the water column. So the water the will suck it out not, of them. Yes, the coral <laughs> is not capable of taking up phosphates if the concentration is lower than that. Yeah. Also, the current science tells us that the natural phosphate concentrations um, limit, it, 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 it's the limiting nutrient. And increasing the ammonium or the nitrate concentrations doesn't help the coral increase its phosphate uptake. 
the limiting factor is the phosphate concentration. Um, we know that stony corals incorporate phosphate into their organic skeleton, we, their matrix. We know that. And we also know that corals prefer ammonium over nitrate for their amino groups that they need to get to build their amino acids, their proteins. This is the reason, by the way, see, all of this makes sense if you think about it. Yeah. This is the reason ammonium doesn't build up in your aquarium and nitrate does, is because the corals are taking whatever ammonium is there mm -hmm. and they leave the nitrate because it's so inefficient for them to get their nitrogen yeah. compounds from the nitrate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what we know now is that the nitrogen compounds limit the color and the number of the zooxanthellae. And we're going to talk about that next, about how this all uh, translates to color. So more and darker zooxanthellae mean means more assimilation of nitrates. Okay. And nitrate assimilation produces radicals like reactive oxygen species that are destructive compounds. Mm -hmm. So we've got a we've got a balance that we have to find here. More and darker zooxanthellae means more nitrate assimilation, which means more radicals. And these are destructive compounds. So when when you see your corals turning brown, mm -hmm. we're, we're heading in this direction. Okay. Phosphates. Phosphates and ammonium help to repair that damage that these re reactive oxygen species cause. So the phosphate and the ammonium, because of the, the amino acids that they get from the ammonium, mm -hmm. These compounds help repair that problem. So question. So you've got kind of a cycle yeah. going on here. Yes. So if you have higher nitrates, does that mean you also would want higher phosphates as well to kind of balance it out and kind of keep that repair balance in a sense going? Under under many circumstances, yes, but not under all circumstances. Okay. But under many circumstances, yes. Um, if you can pull it off without seeing a bunch of algae growth. Mm -hmm. In the best world, you would get those numbers down. You would okay. get that nitrate number down. Corals don't care about nitrate. They really don't. Um, all right. So uh, nitrates make the corals darker because they increase the zooxanthellae photosynthetic pigments, the chlorophyll and the carotenoids. This is the same thing that gives the coral the vibrant co color. But too much nitrate causes the zooxanthellae to explode mm -hmm. in, in growth and get brown. Hmm. And that excessive growth of the zooxanthellae then starves the coral polyp of nutrients. So when you see your corals turning brown, you're looking for a high nutrient level causing that to happen. Because if that's what's going on, now your coral is going to have damage that it can't repair. Okay, so question on this. Now, is that yep. because there's so much nitrates that increases the zooxanthellae and there's not enough nutrients to feed it all? Or is it just is that kind of why it starves it in a weird sense? Um, in a weird sense, yes. Okay. Because the, 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 the coral polyp is also what's keeping the zooxanthellae alive. So mm -hmm. if the if the zooxanthellae growth explodes too much, that now you've got a population of zooxanthellae that the coral polyp can't sustain anymore. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. all right. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna tell you was a little mind bomb for me. Mm -hmm. I did not know this when I learned it. It made tons of sense to me when I figured this out, when, I, when I, my scientist told me about this. But for me, it was one of those moments, like a mind bomb moment. This is it. Zooxanthellae are dinoflagellates. I, maybe yeah. everybody knew this. I did not know this. <laughs> we always think of dinoflagellates as bad. being the bad guys. Yeah. It and, messed with me when I first learned that too. Right? And, yeah. and so zooxanthellae, these, these 
little dudes inside of the coral polyps that we're always talking about being so beneficial, they're dinoflagellates. And we're always talking about, uh, my tank's full of dinoflagellates. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting to me. Mm -hmm. The other part of this that was a mind bomb for me is that all zooxanthellae are brown because the zooxanthellae have the chlorophyll, which is green, but all chlorophyll has associated carotenoids, which are red. And if you take the red and the green, you end up with brown. So zooxanthellae, if you have the right amount and you have the right nutrients, you've got the right amount of coloration, the corals look great. If there's too much nutrients and those zooxanthellae are too happy, they turn brown because there's too much chlorophyll, too much carotenoids, and that brown causes the corals to brown out, and then you're headed for an issue. That, for me, was a little bit of a mind bomb. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about that. Yep. Now, I'm going to show you something about leaves here for a second, and it seems like a non sequitur, but it, it's what brought this all together for me. All chlorophyll has carotenoids that are associated with it. During the summer, I'm in New England. During the summer, mm -hmm. the maple trees are all green yeah. because the sun allows the chlorophyll to act and the, the trees are green. As the fall progresses and the winter comes and the days are getting shorter and shorter, the chlorophyll starts to die off and decrease in the leaves and the carotenoids come out and show their color to protect mm. the tree, to protect the leaves. And that's why the leaves in the fall turn from green to orange and red because the chlorophyll isn't there and the carotenoids are coming forward protecting the leaf so it can stay on the tree longer yeah but it turns the leaf red and that's exactly what happens inside your corals when the nutrient level is too high that's crazy and that's crazy right yes. i just never knew that <laughs> all right so Nitrate and phosphate deficiencies can cause corals to bleach and coral mortality, low photosynthetic pigmentation, low zooxanthellae growth, resulting in low coral polyp nutrition and bleached out corals. So there's a balance that we have to find here that is sometimes a little difficult to get to. And it's also very different in different systems. So here's the big question. If the nutrients on the coral reef, the natural coral reef, are so low, where do these polyps get all of this phosphate from that they need? It doesn't make sense if the nutrients are down below 0.02 that the phosphates, that the corals can get the phosphates that they need. Where are they getting them from? The answer is pretty interesting. Fish excrete ammonium from their gills mm -hmm. and phosphates when they poop. And that's yeah. where corals get their phosphate from. Now, there's a few really interesting parts of this. So let's just look at this carefully for a second. Now, I did a lot of research trying to find fish poop videos. And this was the best thing I could find. People love taking videos of parrot fish pooping because, Devin, as you know, the the sand on sand. the beach is basically parrot fish poop. <laughs> the parrot fish crunch up the coral matrix and they poop out sand. Yeah. So just about the only fish poop videos I could find are about parrot fish. And so they're pretty dramatic. That's a lot of poop. That is a lot of poop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love watching this video. Okay, so, but um, so that's some, what's in most of most most of our tanks are parrotfish poop. Noted. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If it's sand, yes. Yeah. All right. So um, here's a bunch of fish going over a coral reef. These guys are going to poop, and the reef is going to get like phosphates, particulate phosphates, not dissolved phosphate in the water column 
the water column still is going to stay low in phosphates, but these guys are going to poop particulate phosphate all over the reef. Mm. Here's another good example. Here's a nice school, one of my favorite fish, the heniocus. Um, they're pretty. Yeah, they're pretty. And also, um, I, I had a guy in the UK that used to email us every year because he had a heniocus that was literally like 30 years old. And he just he he just was fascinated that the fish could live that long in captivity. Nice. Um, but here's a school of heniocus with corals underneath. They're all going to poop, and there's going to be this glut of phosphates. Now, the interesting piece of this is that the phosphate in the water column stays low. The fish come by and poop on the coral reef, and the phosphate, the particulate, undissolved phosphate level goes way up mm -hmm. for a few minutes and then everything settles and now the phosphate level that the corals are living in is close to zero again <laughs> that's a pulsing of nutrients and the interesting thing about that is what do we do in our reef tanks we're always trying to keep our reef tanks at, a, at some stable yeah. level of nutrients which in some ways is actually hindering the ability of those coral polyps to get the nutrients they, are, they need. They have a much better mechanism for getting particulates, particulate phosphate in a pulsing manner out of the water when it's undissolved than getting the dissolved phosphates that are in the water column. So we're fighting to try to keep our phosphate level at 0.07 or 0.08 or 0.09 and keep it consistent when what those corals really want is a phosphate level in the water column of 0.01 or 0.02 and then every so often you rain particulate phosphate down on them and then it goes back to low yeah which is completely the opposite of what we do so from a hobbyist perspective I know some people dose phosphates directly, but, you know, at the end of the day, better off just getting more fish to poop in your tank. <laughs> well, um, fish are important, for yep. sure. And, um, um, well, I'm going to get product D for a second here. Product D. Sorry. But uh, Tropic Marin is coming out now with uh, two products called Phosfeed and Start. One is for yep. starting a tank and the next is mm -hmm. for just maintaining. Nice where it does exactly this <laughs> undissolvable particulate phosphate yep. in a powdered form huh, this nice. rains down over the corals. Mm -hmm. You can keep your phosphate level extremely low in your water column hmm. and your corals can still get the phosphates that they desperately need. Nice. That's pretty cool. I like it to so be available very soon in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I didn't mean, I wasn't going to get product tonight, but um, the reason I'm excited about this is because I think that this represents a new way of supplying nutrients to corals that has never existed. Yeah, if you could feed them directly without, you know, spiking nitrous in your water, that's pretty awesome. That's really cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm now, some of this, this product does dissolve and it does yeah. raise your phosphate a tiny bit in the water column, but... Mm -hmm. It allows you to keep a much lower phosphate level in the water yeah. column, down around 0.02 or 0.03. Which is awesome. And still maintain getting the phosphates to the corals that you need, which is which is really cool. That That's super cool. Okay, a couple questions from the chat before I forget about the Yeah, moment. that's why I came back. Yeah. That's why I stopped the screen sharing yeah. to come back for a minute. Okay, so Ryan was saying, does nitrate numbers really matter? So too high is trouble. What so I guess what would be in your mind, what is an ideal or acceptable range that you know well, the average hobby should target? Yeah, I mean I think anything up to around ten or fifteen ppm is fine. Um you I don't know a lot of tanks that have a lot of trouble growing algae or or bacteria, you know, cyanobacteria or dinoflagellates up in that, you know. 10 to 15 ppm range mm -hmm. um i know a lot of tanks that are higher than that 20 25 ppm with no trouble um i know a number of tanks a lot of tanks that are lower than that 0.5 uh, you know 5 ppm with no yeah. trouble when you run into trouble 
is when you get down to a phosphate and a nitrate level close to zero. Mm -hmm. That's when you're going to start to see the growth of stuff that you really don't want to see. Yeah. Now, okay, so zero is bad. We, we don't want to have none. You want to have some. But yep. what, what would you consider too much? Like what is too high in your mind? Um, like, like 50, is that bad? 60, 80? Well, 50, was, 50 would be bad. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, it depends. We talked about this in the beginning mm -hmm. of the segment. Systems are all different. Yeah. Um, but in general, I mean, I you know, if we're speaking kind of in general, mm -hmm. I would say that anything over about 25 you're okay. probably asking for trouble. Okay. Right? Yeah. And anything under about four or five, if your phosphate level is also low, mm -hmm. you're probably asking for trouble. Okay. Five to 15, five to 20, ideal, rough yeah. range. Okay. I think that's a sweet spot. But your corals don't care if it's five or 15. They yeah. really don't care. Mm -hmm. It's more about the growth of undesirable stuff Yep. than it is keeping your corals happy because your corals don't really need a lot of nitrate and they'll get mm -hmm. what they need. Now, if someone is deficient in nitrate, what do you suggest is the best way that they add it to their system? Here's where I'm going to disagree with a lot of people out there. I'm going to get a lot of emails about this, <laughs> but I'm going to give you my honest opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit controversial, but I don't like to add a lot of stuff to the tank in chemical form, right? Mm -hmm. Anything you add, if you add food, it's in chemical form. But what I'm talking about is sodium nitrate or stuff like that. Um, to me, if you look at the nitrogen cycle, mm -hmm. it ends with nitrate. Yeah. So if your nitrate is low, mm -hmm. to me, the simplest, most natural way to raise your nitrate is to overfeed your tank. Yeah. Because okay. all, all of the food going into your tank whether it's consumed by fish or not by the way doesn't mm -hmm. matter it's all going to end up as nitrate fair so if your nitrate is low Feed and you throw a bunch of food in the tank every day your mm -hmm. nitrate level is going to go up okay so so he okay i got another interesting one so you said earlier that corals prefer the ammonia or the more ammonium over nitrate because there was a higher percentage they actually get from it yes. so if you were deficient would dosing ammonia to your tank give you that nitrate boost from the corals perspective? I mean, not necessarily from the test perspective. Yeah. I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be ammonia that you would dose. You would probably dose urea. Okay. Um, but I, and, and I actually know a guy that's doing this. I got oh, a guy called oh. me about this. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, he, he 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 was in exactly the situation. He couldn't get his nitrate yeah. level up at all. He tried overfeeding; it didn't work. And he's actually dosing urea in his tank, huh, um, and it is working. Now, I, I'm not going to condone it. I'm not going to say it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But chemically and biologically, it does play out to make sense. There's no yeah. question about it. Um, I'm not ready to endorse it yet as the mm -hmm. way to go. Um, but I, I'm not going to say it's a mistake to try it. it. It makes sense from a biological perspective based on what I just learned. Um, yeah. Like my initial thought would just be like add more fish to your tank and they will breathe and they will produce it for you. But if someone, you know, was still struggling, that potential solution. Yeah, it, it would be urea that you would add. And um, I, I think that it works in principle. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never tested it and I don't know, I only know this one guy that's doing it. So that's not a, you know, that's not a, a test, uh, uh, population, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, it does make sense. And yep. if somebody wanted to try it, I wouldn't say, Oh God, no, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it probably would work. Yeah, I, I think so too. Okay. So we talked about nitrate, you know, for adding or lowering, um, phosphates. I know you have lots of products that reduce phosphates. Do you have ones that boost it up as well if someone's too low? Um, we don't have a specific product for boosting phosphate. We do have phosphate now for yeah. adding particulate phosphate. Is that out now um, or is it coming out? Um, oh, it's it's out in, in Europe. Yeah. We're just waiting, nice. we're just waiting to get it onto the market. 
we we have it in the com- in the country now. We're just waiting to get it into stores. Oh, awesome! That's, um, that's, that's pretty cool. So I'm not a huge fan of raising phosphate in the water column. Mm-hmm. However, there is a way to do it if you want to. Um, and again, not by dumping a liquid phosphate product in the tank. I always look for what in my head seem more natural ways of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fish foods out there that use a lot of phosphate as preservatives. And it'll, it'll say it right on the bottle. If you look at the bottle, it'll, it'll list phosphate in the ingredients as and say preservative. If you go buy one of those fish foods and you feed the tank, that fish food for a while, you'll see the phosphate level go up. And to me, that is somehow a more natural way of doing it. It's probably not all that different than dumping a bunch of phosphate in the tank. It just feels more organic to me. I agree. Well, especially because you're feeding the fish, you're feeding everything else, the particulate matter as well as the byproduct of the phosphate. So I, I definitely agree with the just feed more outlook. It just, to me, it makes the most sense. It's simple. It, it's, it's not easy. based in science. It's just a, you know, it's just a feeling that I have. Yeah. Um, and and I know that it works because I've suggested it to a number of people that have tried it and it works great. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like a good way to do it. It's a gentle way to increase the phosphate level. Nope, that makes sense. I'm staring at the leaves out my window now, comparing them to the coral. <laughs> Just laughing. But it, it, <laughs> Never it, thought it, about that before, did you? <laughs> not at all. And it's it's interesting to have these different kind of perspectives to kind of compare the two. Because, I mean, it is essentially the same process, right? You know, underwater yeah. versus the trees. Yeah, it, it's the same exact process. Mm-hmm. And that's what made it interesting to me was that you're talking about the zooxanthellae turning mm-hmm. brown because they're losing their chlorophyll and yeah. the same thing happens to a leaf. Yep. Exactly. Mother Pretty nature. <laughs> okay. So, so quick, before we move on, one more question. Um, okay. So you said but below 0.02 phosphates in the water, the corals can absorb it. So they need higher than that. Now what happens if phosphates are too high in the water? Not the much for the corals. Mm-hmm. So, you have to get the phosphate level really, really high to bug the corals, Mm -hmm. all right? What happens is with the phosphate level in the water column is that once you get above about 0.25 or 0.3, you're pretty much guaranteeing you're going to start to see the growth of something you don't want. That's fair. But there's no negative impact of the coral per se? Because I remember at one point in time, so they were supposedly to have high phosphates with, you know, stunt growth in your corals. I don't know if that was true or not, but that's something I remember hearing from back in the day. Yeah, it has to get really high. Um, there is a point, and I don't know what the exact number is, but there is a point that if it gets high enough, um, what happens is that it starts to affect the ability of the coral to build calcium carbonate. Okay. It gets into the into the into the mix of the molecule that's that's forming the matrix mm-hmm. that's forming, and it shuts down the formation of the calcium carbonate. Um, but it's got to be really really high to do that. Okay, you're going to have algae problems way before that happens. Um, I've I've pushed my my margin of what I call the sweet spot for the phosphate in the water column. I've pushed it up over the last few months. Um, Originally, I thought it was 0.03 to about Mm 0.1. Now, I feel like it's more on the order of 0.05 to 0.15. Good to know. 0.03 to 0.09 was always what I targeted. So good to to know. Yeah, and and that's always, yeah, no, that's always been kind of where I thought it was best. Um, But... I'm, I haven't seen anything detrimental between like 0.1 and 0.15. And I think it's slightly easier for corals to get a little bit more phosphate if the concentration is a little higher. Although mm-hmm. now with the phosphate and the particulate ability, I think that some of those numbers don't matter as much. Yeah. 
So if someone's at point one, they probably don't need to stress about it as much as they probably think they need to. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, up to point one five really is is, you know, I haven't seen anybody um, unless there's other things going on in the tank causing big problems. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anybody have problems with a point one five phosphate level at all. Yep, perfect. So stop chasing the numbers so much unless you're extremely out of whack. You know, it's one of the biggest messages for people is that you need to look at trends and mm -hmm. and don't i have so many people that call me that you know say my calcium level is 416 and i really want it to be 423 what do i do you know like that's you can't measure it that closely <laughs> that's such a tiny don't spread. <laughs> measure you know don't chase those kind of numbers if if you're if your numbers are you're looking for trends is it mm -hmm. dropping is it rising and yep. where is it kind of at the point that it's dropping or rising? When you start looking at those, I mean, listen, when we're talking about phosphate, we're talking about measuring the difference between 0.05 and 0.06 ppm. Which this is, is ridiculous. Minuscule. Right? Like, <laughs> it, it's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. So is it kind of in the range I want? Is it or above or below the range I want? How long has it been there? Is it moving up or is it moving down? Those are really the things you're looking at rather than is it 0 0.06 or 0 0.07? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, don't chase it. <laughs> Look at the trends. You know, long as, it, It's nice to know that it's, you know, essentially a bigger range. And now, historically, in my mind, I always worried more about phosphate than nitrates, but it sounds like higher nitrates are more of the issue than higher phosphates, which is interesting. Higher... A bit different than 100%. my previous thought process. Hundred percent higher mm -hmm. nitrates. You well, higher phosphates are a problem, mm -hmm. but they have to be much higher than what you normally keep. Yeah. Than higher nitrates. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so if someone know, has high nitrates. What is what is your methodology, or you know, what products, or what would you do to bring them back down? Well, if they also have high phosphates. Mm -hmm. Carbon dosing is a great way to go. Yep. But carbon dosing is really better for maintenance in the long run. Okay. Right? If you've got a high nitrate level, hands down, the best thing to do is water changes. Mm -hmm. If you do a 50% water change, you get rid of 50% of your nitrates. Yep. So this is where I, I go back to water changes as being a really wonderful intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people always, you know, if, whenever I say that people point a finger at me, they say, yeah, because you're a salt company. Um, yeah, that maybe that's true. But at the end of the day, if you've got a high nitrate level and you need to reduce it, whatever percentage water change you do, you're going to reduce your nitrates by that percentage. Mm -hmm. And that's super useful. Right. So even in a larger system, if you do a 30 percent water change, reducing your nitrates by 30 percent is a pretty big change. Makes sense. You know, so um, I, I think water changes. And then if you've got a tank that tends to drift up all the time in nitrates and phosphates, mm -hmm. now you're talking about your your um, uh, carbon dosing really being a wonderful approach to maintain those lower levels that you want to maintain. Makes sense. So if it's quick fix, just do a big water change. If it's a chronic thing where it constantly just goes back up, then carbon dosing is going to be your your method to deal with it. Yeah, and and not too quick a mm -hmm. fix because again, if your if your polyps, if your animals are used to living in fifty ppm nitrate, mm -hmm. you don't want to put them in twenty ppm nitrate tomorrow. So too big of a water change could be bad. Yes. <laughs> Always yeah. change slowly, even when going from bad to good. Yep. <laughs> right? You didn't you didn't create this problem overnight. You shouldn't fix it overnight. Yeah. No, that's wise. That's wise. In the only every... exception really to that yeah. rule of changing something quickly is if something major happens you know somebody throws a bunch of pennies in your tank or mm -hmm. a heater the, the the casing on a heater breaks or you know something like that Extreme. Yeah. 
yeah, when there's some really acute situation that's going to kill things overnight, you have to fix it. Mm -hmm. But barring that kind of an emergency acute situation, slow is always, always better. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, okay, Bert. Biggest thing testing phosphate is when you test fluctuates during day and night jump dramatically after feeding. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trust it directly after I feed. I'd wait a while for things to dissolve before I considered that number. But yeah, for sure. And, and you know, that question really addresses the point that some foods have a lot of phosphate in them as yep. preservative. Yep. And so when you feed the tank, your phosphate level is going to bounce up. I didn't know phosphate was actually preservative. I thought it was just a byproduct that was in the food, but no, it's a, it's a, it's well, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's, it's used as a preservative in foods and, and, uh, some foods have more of it than others. Generally mm -hmm. the, the, I don't want to say higher level, but the, 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 the better foods tend mm -hmm. to use a little less phosphate as preservative. Yeah. Um, but it's often used in, in lots of foods and, I won't, I don't, I don't want to talk about brands or anything, but um, one place that you sometimes see it really drastically dramatic numbers mm -hmm. is in some frozen foods. Yeah. Do you, okay. That's actually a good one. Do you prefer like pelletized food or frozen food? Personally, I prefer pellets. Okay. And the reason I do is because the fish that we keep in our tanks, and this is true for the corals too, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about fish food when you're yeah. talking about pellets. The fish that we keep in our tank, we feed them at best two times a day or three times a day. Mm -hmm. On a coral reef, they're eating all day long. That's all yeah. they do. They mm -hmm. look for food all day and they eat all day long. Yep. And so if we're only going to feed them two or three times a day, we need to pack as much nutrition as we can into each bite that they get. Mm -hmm. It's got to be high quality, high protein food yep. um, that gives them everything they need because they're only going to eat a couple of times. Yep. And Makes so, sense. you know, think about if you went to one meal a day, mm -hmm. you'd have to make that meal really healthy. And, and that's what we do to our fish in our, in our tanks. So mm -hmm. I like pellets because if you can get the fish over to pellets, you're going to be able to pack more nutrition into each bite that they get. Mm -hmm. And they need that because they're not eating and pecking at stuff all day long like they are on a reef. Or better yet, auto feeder and feed them multiple times, more times per day. Um, multiple smaller feedings, yep. absolutely the best way to go. It's mm -hmm. also better for your corals, by the way. Um, your corals are filter feeders. They're feeding all day long. What do mm -hmm. we do? We come in in the morning and, and target feed them and then broadcast at night or vice versa. Yeah. Um, twice a day, maybe. Um, again, they're filter feeding all day long on the reef. So high nutrition value per unit of volume is always what you're looking for in your foods. And mm -hmm. if you look at frozen foods, I'm not against frozen foods. Sometimes the fish really love them. But if you look at the nutritional content in, in frozen foods, they're mm -hmm. generally nowhere near the volume, per volume uh, nutritional content of uh, a good pellet food. Okay. All right, you're swaying me. I feed mainly frozen, but I'm going to start going a little more on the pellet side. Mix it up a little bit, you know? <laughs> That's don't what I do now, don't but... leave the frozen food yeah. altogether. But if you can get those guys eating some pellets, they're going to get better nutrition. Um, look at the nutritional breakdown on mm -hmm. your frozen food, and then look at the nutritional breakdown on a good quality pellet. Yeah. Now, here's one thing about frozen foods. When you look at the nutritional breakdown, make sure that it is the wet analysis, not the dry analysis. Mm -hmm. Many of the frozen foods list extremely high protein content, because they're talking about the dry weight. Yeah. You have to make sure that it's the wet weight on the package that okay. they're talking about. Good to know. And again, just so I, I don't want to offend all the frozen food companies out there. I'm not against frozen foods yeah. at all. I just like to be able to also supplement with a higher nutritional value per unit of volume pellet. It's okay. I, you've just sold me on setting the auto feeder back up to give them pellets in the afternoon. Make a selfie. Awesome. 
<laughs> awesome. Yep. Um, I love convincing you of stuff. <laughs> perfect. That's good though. I like it. Um, I don't know if you want to answer this one, but in the chat, they're asking, what's a good high quality pellet? What do you recommend? I don't know if you want to throw brands out, but. I will throw a brand out. Um, and I'm full transparency. In addition to being the CEO of Tropic Marin USA, uh, uh, Leslie and I are also the U.S. office for this German company. Um, mm -hmm. The reason we took this German company on to sell their products is because, number one, they're the premier fish medication, ornamental fish medication company in the world. Mm -hmm. And number two, they uh, they uh, manufacture and sell um, Dr. Basilier's bio fish food. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Devin, I did not want to sell fish food. Yeah. Um, I've known these guys that run this company for a very long time because they distribute their products with Tropic Marin in Europe together. Mm -hmm. And I've known them for years. And they came to us, to Leslie and I, and they, they wanted us to bring their, their products into the country, particularly their fish food. And I said, I, I really don't want to because there's a lot of good fish foods out there. Yeah. A lot of good, high quality fish foods at a really good price. Not interested in doing it. Um, and they said, no problem. We're going to send you a bunch of samples, use them in your tank, and um, see what you think. Yeah. So I used them. In At that point, I had the cichlid tank, 150 mm -hmm. African tank. When I saw what those fish looked like a month or two later, I was convinced. And I called them up and I said, let's do it. Um, very high in yeah. protein. Mm -hmm. And all of the raw protein comes from wild caught Scandinavian whitefish. So it's all very clean, pristine protein. Uh, Dr. Basilier is one of the top fish biologists in the, in the, in the, in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, these are his formulas. Each type of food does a little different thing. I, I was going to say they um, have a lot. There's a lot of different types of food. Yeah, he's a big one. On He does what he calls nutricaments. Mm -hmm. And these are natural additives that all accomplish something different. Um, and so it's good to kind of mix up the foods that you're using. I'm a huge fan of the acai mm -hmm. because it brings out the colors in the fish. Um, I also love the pumpkin and the lapacho. Um, and then the, he's got a, a whole program for um, ick, for for stopping the ick cycle with a food called matrine. Um, yes. So there's, there's a lot of different foods. They all do something a little different. Yep. They're not expensive. They, they fall kind of in the mid range of, of what foods cost and they are super high quality. And I'm not afraid to vouch for them because mm. um, if I had the pictures on my computer, I could show you what my fish looked like. They look like <laughs> completely different fish yeah. two months down the road. So, question: If I want to try them, where does one find them? Are, are um, you distributed them? Like, are they anywhere to actually get them in U.S.? Oh Canada? yeah, there's a lot of sources online. Uh, okay. Bulk Reef Supply has some. Uh, Ken's Fish has some. KJ Aquatics has some. Uh, Super Cichlids has them. Okay, perfect. There's a number of different sources online for them. Okay, I'm gonna try some. I'm gonna order some and try it. And they're different sizes. You want to use a slightly smaller pellet than what you would normally think you should use because the, the food, the pellets are very dense. They're very hard. Mm -hmm. And um, you want to use one that's smaller so that it goes down the digestive tract easily of the fish. Okay. Um, if you cut open a, a good sized fish that dies, you'll see that their tri digestive tract is really much smaller than, than you think it would be. Mm -hmm. um, so use a slightly smaller pellet, one size down from whatever you're using now. Um, and um, I, you take a picture of your fish and then a month down the road, take another picture and compare them. Uh, yeah. The owner of the company keeps, um, uh, talk about fresh water for a minute, but the owner, one of the owners of the company keeps Altum Angels. And he yeah. showed me pictures before and after of his Altum Angels. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe the difference. Huh. So it's really, cool. you know, I don't have, um, I don't have pictures on my computer, uh, but I, I, we'll see if this will work. I don't know if this is going to work. 
You said the Asai one was one of your favorites. Okay. Throw one uh, right Asai, card. yeah. Asai. So Asai. let's see if you let's see if you'll be able to see this. I don't know. Do Does it. that show up? Or it gets whited out. Yeah, those it's a are his ultimate away. angels, and that's the before picture. Okay. And this fish right in the front mm -hmm. is the dominant male. And w one month after feeding Asai, that fish looked like this this is the same fish believe it or not oh yeah that's like, there was yeah there's like no redder color on the before well huh. and look at the black lines that's yeah. the key you know if you feed a high beta carotene food you can get that red color uh if you if you have a tank full of yellow tangs and you feed them a high beta carotene food they start mm -hmm. to turn kind of orange um because the, the beta carotene kind of dyes them. Yeah. So you can do that red part with beta carotene, but you're not going to get those black lines to be vivid like that. The acai is what does that. There's actually a wonderful story um, that Dr. Basilier told me that he was collecting fish in the Amazon basin, and he went to this one place, and he caught some fish, and they looked really vividly much brighter than the fish that he was catching any place else of the same species. Mm -hmm. So he said to the guide that was taking him around, um, why, you know, we got to get the collectors to come here because the fish are so much prettier here. The guide said, no, you don't, you don't need to get the, the collectors here. You just need to feed them the berries. And he <laughs> showed them that all around that area were acai palms that drop the berries in the water and the fish eat the berries. And that's why the colors came out. Oh, the cool thing about the acai berry is that it enhances the color of the fish by making the fish healthier in a way that brings out the color, not by dyeing it red. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty cool. Wow. We, we really went down a rabbit hole, didn't we? We did. There's already one in my BRS cart for next order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try it. You have to tell me how you like it. I will. Um, like I said, I was convinced because the cichlids looked complete. I had a zebra obliquidens that had a gray black background with, with uh, black lines. Mm -hmm. And I had had them for like three or four years. And I started feeding him the acai. And a month later, he had, I can show you the picture of him. He had red, green, and yellow on his body yeah. that had never shown up before. Huh. And the weird thing about that was that I had been feeding him the acai for a while. The color didn't change. And then one day I woke up and I looked at him and he was all colorful. It like yeah. happened overnight. That's it was cool. really weird. That's pretty cool. Hey, changing the diet. If your fish also are brighter, more colorful, that's pretty awesome. There you go. <laughs> Give it know. a try and let me know how you like it. I will. It's going to go my auto feeder that I'm installing for lunchtime snacks. There you go. Wow, I, man, we went down, on we it. went rabbit we holes. went to a whole different place than we planned on tonight. Yeah. So speaking of rabbit holes, I heard rumors that you're uh, taking over some of the Magna stuff. Yeah, I'm now the VP of Magna. Very nice. Um, and uh, there was just a wonderful article in Coral Magazine with our president Travis mm -hmm. Knorr, uh, telling a lot about what went on and a lot about where we're headed. Um, we have now scheduled our Macna for 2024 at the Swan and Dolphin Resort nice. in Orlando. Um, we are changing things drastically about the way Macna runs. Um, you tell. Friday is now an education day, and we're running three different tracks, mm -hmm. a beginner, intermediate, and advanced track. Nice. There are five lectures in each track. One of those lectures is a hands-on workshop. Nice. Uh, I like it. We're bringing in people from all over. We're actually doing a cute thing. We didn't want to call them beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Yeah. Because we felt, who's going to want to be in a beginner track? So in, in deference to corals, the beginner track is the planula track. The intermediate track is the settler track. And the advanced track is the recruit track. And there's four lectures, and then a fifth lecture where everybody comes together with a panel. Um, and that's never been done before at MACNA. And we're, we're, we also, we also are going to have a junior acarus workshop for acarus that are 12 to 17 years old with a lot of hands-on stuff and water testing and aquascaping and stuff. Um, 
it's going to be a different kind of conference than MACNA has ever run. It's the largest show floor that MACNA has ever had. Yes. Um, I'm I'm super excited about it. Oh, that will be pretty cool. My my last one was a couple of years ago. I might have even been the Swan. No, it was a different resort, but it was at the last Orlando one. A couple pre World went crazy. Yeah, so. that was that was <laughs> yeah. the that was the Dolphin. Okay, yeah. um, that was 2019. I yep. spoke at that conference. Yeah. Um, that was the conference that ended with the hurricane. Yep. Stranding everybody at the airport. Oh, um, I say at the resort went to Disney every day. It was perfect. It was great. Oh, great nice. <laughs> we Leslie and I got in that little two hour gap yep. that the airport opened up, and we were able to get out. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Well, you made it up. I'm not going to lie. I was happy to stay and the lineups were very short at Disney. It was, it was a, re it was a really fun trip. I actually enjoyed it. The hurricane never fully did anything. So yeah, it's good. Awesome. Yeah. We're super excited about the fact that, you know, Mac Mazna and Macna were in real trouble after Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And, um, it took us quite some time to work through all the difficulties, but we have a very, very dynamic board now filled with amazing ideas and you're going to see a different macna in 2024 mm -hmm. and you're going to see moving forward completely new masna and macna um yeah. our membership drive which is going to be starting uh very soon mm -hmm. uh, is you know we've never had a lot of members and the reason masna's never had a lot of members is because there weren't many member benefits. Uh, you got into the MACNA an hour early, but that was about it. Yeah. Well, we've got brand new benefits now, discounts at BRS and saltwateraquarium.com, nice. uh, Coral Magazine, uh, Amazonas. There's, there's tons and tons of really exciting benefits to being a member. Nice, um, awesome. We've upped the membership fee uh, because we have these ama amazing mm -hmm. benefits that pay you back for the membership, you know, uh, like uh, many times. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping we can go into the conference in 2024 with a decent number of members. Um, we have a very dynamic board now, and I'm going to be excited to have a dynamic membership to pull new board members from. Nice. And to help this organization move forward. You know, I've been exhibiting at MACNA for close to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't see it dissolve. I just didn't didn't see that as a good thing for the industry moving forward. We have, you know, the Reefapaloozas and the Aquashellas and the Reef Stocks. And, you know, but MACNA has always been different. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that, the industry needs. I think that it can be better for the industry moving forward. It can do more. Yep. And we're going to try to do all of that. Nice. And um, we're really excited about where it's headed. Sounds like a pretty, pretty solid overhaul on everything. It's being completely overhauled. We're, yep. we're changing the whole back end of it. And we have plans moving forward that are super, super exciting. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, good to hear. I I like your direction you're taking it, so it's pretty awesome. Well, I hope you're going to come in 24 because 24 to. is going to be a couple years. Yeah, we got to get you down there. It's going to be a completely yeah. different uh, kind of conference. Okay, so in the chat, someone was just asking too. When is it? So 30th of August, 2024. August 30th, nice. 31st, right. <laughs> and September 1st. The Ed Day is Friday, August 30th, mm -hmm. and then the show the show floor is open on the 31st and the 1st. Nice. Okay, perfect. And then the first day of 30 is going to be very heavy education day, different talks of all levels of reefing. Yeah, when you go, well, we're going to be making tickets available very soon. You can go to mm -hmm. masna.org and, uh, oh, sorry, you can go to macna.org, um, macna.com, I think it is actually. I'll check. Is it org? Okay. So magnet.org. <laughs> I've got to get this right. Uh, yeah. Go to magnet.org and you can leave a note that you want to be notified um, when tickets become available. And if you're going to come to the Ed Day, you're going to mm -hmm. pick each lecture that you want to take. Ah, so you have to pre pick it. There, yeah, there's three okay. tracks. Yeah. So you get to pick which one you want to take first, 
and which of the three you want to take second and which of the three you want to take third. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, you can, you don't have to take all of the same ones in that track. You can, you can okay. bounce back and forth from track to track. Nice. I'm working on bringing in some amazing new talent to give lectures on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, the show floor will not be open that day. So it's only the Ed day on Friday. And then the show floor is open all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Nice. Ah, that'll be good. I'm excited for it. Okay. Qu just one other question from the chat that scroll by. I forgot about it. Um, all for reef. Does it matter if it's exposed to light and will it change it? Yeah. I said a while ago. I forgot to ask you. Um, good question. Um, if all for reef is exposed to light and air, mm -hmm. it'll eventually grow something. Okay. Um, sometimes it even grows little fuzzy stuff right in the bottle. Yeah. They're not detrimental. It's beneficial bacteria. It doesn't even matter if that were to get in your tank, mm -hmm. but it takes quite a long time for it to grow something. Okay. So if you mix it up and you kind of keep it sheltered and covered, it lasts usually way longer than the amount you dose it you know, the amount of time it takes to dose whatever you made up, if you made up a liter or two. Yep. If you made up a gallon and you kept it for six months, <laughs> yeah, it's going to grow something. As but, I look over um, my five-gallon dosing containers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But in general, it takes an awful long time for that to happen. So in general, it's not a problem unless okay. you're holding it for a really long time. Okay, that's fair. Perfect remember who that was that asked it five minutes ago okay yeah All well right. we ran a little bit over here we're you know yeah that's okay it's good stuff can't pass, <laughs> can't pass it up uh you are welcome dr aqua uh do 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 any other good stuff we should hit on today well there's always good stuff to hit on but let's oh, hit so, and see if there's any more questions before we call it a night yeah yeah if i if i missed your question please do ask it again i try to keep track but sometimes i get lost in the chat Okay. I think, Devin, I just want to say, yep. I think you do an awesome job of keeping track of the chat because I think it's m some massive multitasking you're doing there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I try. I do what I can. Um, okay. So nitrates, phosphates, more than 0.02 is important. Under 0.15, you're pretty solid range anywhere in there. For, for phosphate? Yeah, for phosphate. Uh, nitrates, we're going to say... 5 to 15 is a pretty solid range. Less than 25, you're still fairly happy. Above there, consider lowering it as like a good yep. kind of summary. Um, where is Magna going to be next year from Miggy? It is going to be in Orlando at the Disney Swan Resort. At I the believe. Disney Swan yeah. and Dolphin Resort. Excellent. And I was there four years ago. It was pretty cool. Um, will phosphates turn soft coral white? I have no idea on that one. I don't either. I don't think so. Uh, if they're deficient in phosphates, I mean, if you're starving it, possibly, but I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, my guess would be that if you have soft corals that are turning white and losing their color, my guess would be it's probably something other than the phosphate level. I, I would agree, but I don't know what it would be. But I don't. I don't know what it would be. <laughs> Unless it's starred for light, and that was why it was losing color. But yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't had that. I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. I got stumped. You got to ask yeah. one more. I don't want to end on a stumped yeah, question. That's fair. Uh, okay, Charles. What level phosphates need to maintain for carbon dosing for reducing nitrates to be effective? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so for carbon dosing, because I know it's a difference if you have higher phosphates or lower phosphates. So fill us in. Yeah, I mean, with carbon dosing, the whole idea is to keep it in that target range of 0.05 to 0.15. Mm -hmm. So you, you'd like to have the carbon dosing happening so that you're getting that phosphate funneled to your corals through the bacteria mm -hmm. and you maintaining a phosphate level of 0.05 to 0.15. Yep. All right. Perfect. Good one um the food you talked about the food what was the brand name dr dr basselier b-a-s-s-l-e-e-r dr basselier bio fish food 
Look, it's on sale right now. I have one in my cart. It's actually very, <laughs> very affordable too. It's starting eight bucks. It's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, really, really affordable. Eight, 11. Yeah, super affordable. Beautiful. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try the Asai one. I want a full report. All right. The auto feature is coming back out. All right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed today's stream. If so, be sure to hit that like button. Um, I am most definitely going to bribe Lou back on in a few months for more streams because you're always a wonderful guest and a fountain of knowledge. So Always thank- fun to be on. Always fun yeah. to be on. Perfect. So thank you again for coming on. Um, anyone watching this on the replay, if you have any like really good topics you want us to go over for the next one, let me know in the comments below afterwards and we'll definitely dig into it. But yeah, thank you again for coming on today. Uh, Devin, thanks so much. Excellent. It's been a good one. Yeah. Magna 2024 in August. I'm actually looking forward to that one. That should be a lot of fun. So I'm happy to hear that you're revamping and doing a lot of awesome changes to mix it up a bit. So it'll be good. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks.